Is it time? It is time for us to do what we have been doing, and that time is every day. We'll know in a very short period of time, but it looks like it could be something that will be uh, not good. Believe me, not good. Um, so, uh, you know, I see issue with yeah, that. And again, okay, you're, hey, 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 hey. Uh, you're not going to be able to insult your way to the presidency. That's not going to happen. I don't know who created Pokemon Go. Go. But I'm trying to figure out how we get them to have Pokemon go to the polls. I'm Ted Cruz, and my pronoun is kiss my ass. So when you think about it, there is great significance to the passage of time in terms of what we need to do to lay hey, these wires, hey, hey, hey. what we need to do <laughs> to create these we jobs. Will not get 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 America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was going to put him in a foot. foot. Uh, Not good. Believe me, not good. What's up, everyone? A pleasant good morning to you. Welcome, Dissidents One and All. This is the Do Dissidents Podcast. My name is Keaton Weiss. As uh, some of you already know, as Robbie Burns says here, Russell working out in the heat. That is true. So I am by myself for the moment, but only for a very, very brief moment because we have here very very good friend of the show you all know who he is an anti-war activist and the subject of our upcoming dissident documentary our good pal jose vega jose what's up my friend great to see you again it's hot out here you know i i pray for us i hope he's okay you know what does he do yeah it's it's uh it's hot it was 90 degrees we were out there in front of the oppenheimer the amc theaters giving out leaflets you know and uh I hope he's staying hydrated. That's what's up. Yeah, yeah. He's got a 12-hour gig today. I know from being a New York City tour guide, doing those gigs in the past, it is it is hard, hard work. So, yes, all the best to Russ. But thank you for being here, my friend. Folks, I'm having a little bit of internet problems today, so if I'm buffering a little bit, I apologize. I have everything wired correctly, but the internet is just a little here. If I can... If I can describe it for you my internet is a little like this today this is this is my internet right now <laughs> and i don't really understand what's going on tried everything but yeah that's that's the way it's going so if i buffer from time to time i apologize hopefully my audio is coming through when we were when we met for a little tech check uh jose said my audio was pretty constant sometimes the video is buffering in and out so hopefully uh that resolves itself throughout the morning but uh just wanted to give you guys a heads up there uh thank you to abiding for kicking us off with a 99 cent super sticker super chats uh and super stickers are super helpful especially on these morning streams that's what makes these morning streams possible and it's very important that you hit that like button we have to juice the algorithm in the morning there are not as many youtube audience viewers around in the morning so we need all the help we can get in the morning so please do hit that like button uh, and hit that subscribe button if you're already, uh, if you are not already subscribed, and go over to Jose's YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button there. Jose, what's your what's your YouTube channel called? I'm playing dumb. I know what it's called, but go ahead, get your. <laughs> My uh, YouTube channel is called Declaring Independence, and I actually just typed it into the YouTube chat from the channel, so people can easily find it. So beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great channel. It's a great channel. You guys just had Jimmy Dore on your channel, right? A, a few a uh, couple weeks ago. We had Jimmy Dore on last week, yeah. And uh, you know, we're working on a Victoria Newland uh, mini doc that uh, is about a third of the way done, and that's on the channel. People can see we've had interesting interviews with people like Oliver Stone, Scott Ritter. Uh, you yeah, guys. your guest list is very impressive, and it's well deserved for sure. Thank you. Yeah. That Scott Ritter piece had like what seventy thousand views when you put it up. That was like one of your first episodes you did. And that, yeah, and that was the very first like episode we put up. <laughs> yeah, quite a way to launch a channel. Beautiful. 
Absolutely, absolutely beautiful. So we got a lot we're going to cover today, folks. Thank you all for being here very, very much. I uh, just want to start with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we had a lot of you sign up for our Patreon in response to our last episode's patron drive. Don't forget, we have been warned by YouTube. So the next offense, they will disappear us for a week. They'll put the bag over our head and lock us in a corner for a week, and we won't be able to get in touch unless you follow us on another platform. So we had a lot of people sign up at the Substack as free subscribers. That's amazing. We had over a dozen of you guys sign up and become Patreon supporters. That is super important. Thank you so much for that. Um, and so uh, please, yes, find another way to stay in touch with us. We just want to make that brief public service announcement uh, before we get started. So we're going to get jump right in here to our first story. Russ and I covered uh, a little bit uh, the RFK sort of Israeli summit, if you will, on the uh, <laughs> West Side Highway um, <laughs> uh, last week. Um, but uh, we have some more footage that I want to show you from inside that hall. And uh, perhaps you may recognize a certain uh, voice in this. That Oh. oh no. <laughs> thank you, thank you. When you run for president, we're gonna have you up here. But right now he is, so let him speak. Thank you very much. You gotta, you gotta, no, 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 no. He is running for president. You gotta, we will have questions at the end. We will. We're gonna have questions at the end, and if you're quiet now, I'll choose you first, okay? If you're silent now, I'll give you the first question. If you're not, you know, I asked why is this night so different than all other nights. It turns out <laughs> I had jokes. no idea. Okay. He's got jokes. He's one of ours for sure. Who was that, you ask? Well, it may sound familiar. Here we got a picture of the certain audience member who got up and tried a little intervention of his own. But this was not like most of your interventions because you had a little flyer in your hand. And you had a flyer in your hand for a reason because you're going to be speaking at an anti-war rally on the east side of new york city right near the united nations on sunday august 6th so why don't you tell us a little bit about first why you were there um how that intervention went and the message you were trying to get across uh to to rfk yeah uh well you know you're right it definitely was different than any of the other interventions i've done because i happen to like rfk jr i don't endorse him or support him i like him but he's terrible on this israeli stuff i mean you know and then the ra and then having rabbi shmuley who like if you go and watch that thing right the rabbi just wouldn't shut up and the guy was just like <laughs> 20 minute intro of RFK yeah no jr. huge intro okay. speech yeah you know, it's an RFK Jr. in event, but this rabbi just could not stop talking. And, um, you know, I knew that uh, some of our friends from INN and others like Lucy and uh, uh, others who intervened. Crab was there, right? They were there. I knew they were there. I knew, I knew they had that covered. And in my mind, it's difficult because it's like, I like what he's saying around the anti-war stuff around Ukraine and what he did on June 20th, referencing his uncle's speech, talking about how... You know, we need to see ourselves in the enemy's shoes and how we try to paint the world as black and white, that there are bad guys and good guys. It's like, that's good, but this stuff is not. And so I was like, okay, well, is there a way I can kind of like break him out of the the hypnotized zone he's in? You know, if I can get a message across, you know, so that he doesn't get shot in the back of the head by the Mossad or something. Right. Uh, you know, because <laughs> they're. Because I, because I, I like I told you, there was there was one question he got where basically they asked him, "Are you doing all this because you're afraid of being called anti-Semitic?" And he looks at the guy, he's like, "No, that's not why." Yeah, and, it's at the very end. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of ambiguous as to like, well, then why are you doing this? Right. Like it could be a number of reasons. Anyway, uh, so I stood up and um, I said, "Look, Mr. Kennedy, I support your message for you know anti-war." We're having this rally on August 6th. It's a Humanity for Peace rally. And which, by the way, um, we still do need funds for. Um, and so I've made it so that if anybody buys a AOC war poster, I'm out. I'm fresh out. Somebody bought like 20 to help support the rally. But if anybody buys one of our AOC war posters, they can 
help support the rally. All the proceeds will go right back to the, the rally. We still need like another $600 or so to make the concert. Yep. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's the, that's the humanity for peace. Yep. And uh, people can also go to the website there. It's happening at Hammershall Plaza, 42nd street and second Ave. There's the address right there. Um, and also, if people uh, feel generous enough, they can donate to my cash app, which is on my bio on the Twitter, and all the money will go right back to, to the concert. But we, what you see on the bottom of that poster is you see tons and tons of different inter international organizations, right? So some of them are domestic to the United States. A lot of them do a lot of international work, and they've all decided we're basically doing the Rage Against the War Machine idea of coalition building. And we've really gone like over the edge with it. And we've got like international speakers coming to this thing. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's going to be great. Um, that's at Dag Hammarskjöld Plaza on 47th Street and 2nd Avenue, right near the UN. It basically overlooks the UN. Uh, just a bit of trivia, that was the original lineup site for the original Women's March in 2017. So you might find some pink pussy hats on the floor left no. over from the original uh, <laughs> Women's March there. That was the big lineup over at Dag Hammarskjöld Plaza. Um, and they listed their demands here, the immediate ending of all funding and weapons to Ukraine, convene immediate unconditional peace talks, the dissolution of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO obviously, and a new international security architecture must be created to end the division of the world into blocks, eliminating geopolitics. This new architecture must take into account the security concerns of every sovereign nation, large or small. You're going to be speaking there. Is that correct? I sure am. And I will be shoulder to shoulder with like Scott Ritter, who's also speaking. Um, and uh, we have uh, some Republican presidential candidate who's also speaking, Aaron Day. We have uh, a Haitian presidential candidate, which is like, oh, oh wow, yeah, yeah, among other people, Gerald Salenti, um, uh, uh, other people escaped my. Uh, right, well, actually, I have the list here. Yeah, uh, right. Okay, so Aaron Day, that's the Republican candidate for president. Uh, Jude Ellie, Haitian presidential candidate. Um, <clears throat> we have the president and founder of the Guinean American League of Friends for Freedom speaking. We have Terry Strong. She's a reverend who will be also speaking. Um, Gerald Salenti, I already said. Mike Termat, um, and uh, more people. Just, you know, it's 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 great. And we're working on a, another big name who I can't spoil, but hopefully, if it works out, you'll hear about it soon. So beautiful. Well, I will be there in the audience. I'll be watching. I'll be filming you for the uh, doc that we have uh, coming up that we are putting together. So I'll be in the crowd cheering you on there, my friend. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, what were some of your other takeaways from that RFK Israel event? Because the thing that I found amazing was when I watched Rabbi Shmuley's introduction, he says, I don't agree with Bobby on vaccines or on Ukraine. And, and that gave me pause because that made me think, well, maybe, I mean, RFK must really just be a true believer on all of this Israel stuff because yeah. like vaccines in Ukraine are his two main issues right like he centers those way more than he centers his israel support this 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 sort of unconditional support for the israeli government um is sort of something that keeps coming up because he keeps getting dragged by the left flank of whatever coalition he's trying to build but but that's really not what he's putting out there but if shmuley is not with him on the medical stuff and he's not with him on ukraine it really does speak volumes to just how dug in he is as just a staunch backer of yeah. Israel, it, that's that's I I um I understand that he was getting attacked as being anti-Semitic because of some New York Post article that came out about some offhanded remarks that he said COVID doesn't target Jews, and then it was right. something that the Jewish community actually reports less cases of COVID, whatever. And he did a total like this was not the way to go with getting this rabbi guy to actually speak for him. I do think Bobby does believe what he says when it comes to Israel. I genuinely believe he doesn't think it's an apartheid state. Uh, there's a lot more to it. Like, for example, his father was a supporter of Israel. But what was interesting was that in the beginning of Rabbi Shmuley's speech, he says, you know, Sirhan Sirhan, 
or as he was building it up emotionally, Robert Kennedy Sr. was one of the greatest patriots of this country yeah, yeah, for yeah. the love of Israel. And he was killed. Why? Because of his genuine love for the people of Israel. And who was he killed by? Sirhan Sirhan, a rabid Palestinian right. who hates Jews. Robert Kennedy Jr. has gone on the record many times before where he believes Sirhan Sirhan did not kill his father. Of course. Yep. You know? And he, he said that. He, he talked about that also at the at the uh, the summit, as you call it, where he says he visited Sirhan Sirhan in prison, and he does not share the rabbi's views that Sirhan Sirhan killed his father, um, or at least was was was, or he believes he was a patsy for for killing his father. And um, you know, there's a lot more to Bobby that I think this Israeli stuff shows that he's susceptible to some kind of influence and corrupting influence that will manipulate you know, his policy-making decisions when it comes to the Middle East. And he admitted that Israel has a nuclear bomb. Right. Which, he said uh, that, too. Yeah. Yeah. When you say he's susceptible to corrupting influence that might, you know, sway him in certain directions, I think that's a long way of saying what I've been saying all along, which is why I've been much more dismissive of him in general than many in this space, which is he's a Democrat. Yeah. Right. I mean, he's committed to running as a Democrat. When you commit to running as a Democrat, despite the fact that your natural base of support is so clearly outside the party, that's that that demonstrates exactly what you just said there, that there's something about him that he look, he's a Kennedy. He is American royalty. He is an insider at the end of the day. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's just I mean, I, I, I said this last time when we talked about the event that you know when you get a bad piece of press like that the best thing you can do if it is a smear and look i think the the idea that he's anti-semitic is just obviously absurd so it was a smear in that sense the best thing you do you issue a statement about it and you move on you don't you don't double and triple down by doing an event like this which you know is going to do you more harm than good because the dug in zionist democrats are establishment aligned Democrats. They're supporting Biden for a whole host of other reasons. And so it just made no sense. But it was great that you were there. It was great that a lot of the INN crew was there. I mean, I don't know how many people were in that hall, but it seemed like a decent percentage of the crowd were there to push back. No, they, they listen, they were all either really Zionist or really pro RFK Jr. Um, and I was also happy that after the event, uh, Kynan and I were just sitting at a stoop like a block away. And uh, we had like a couple guys come up to us. It's like, oh, are you are you the guy who did the thing at the Columbia School of Journalism? And I was like, yep, that's me. And so we talked for like 15 minutes. And this guy, you know, he said, look, I don't really pay too much attention to politics. I like RFK. I mean, I've been voting Democrat my whole life. And I think what RFK has been doing is right. And I think what you've been doing is right. And I asked them, like, not even trying to be a wise-ass or anything. I just wanted to know. So did you know of RFK's position on Israel before you came? And he said, um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I would like to think in principle I'm pro-Israeli, right? I mean, I, I just, you know, and, and I asked him, do you know about what other people say when it comes to Palestinians and why people call Israel an apartheid state? And he said, honestly, no, I, I don't. And I'm open to hear why, but I've just grown up my whole life thinking that Israel has a right to exist. And what that did was that opened my eyes to, to a certain class of people who probably really don't hear about the fact that uh, of the crimes that Israel is committing against the Palestinians. And they just have this narrative in their minds that there's this evil terrorist group named Hamas who's going after the, uh, the, the people in Israel. And they're just like, yeah, I mean, well, it makes sense to me that you would want to support Israel, right? And he was open to hearing what kind of and I had to send. He was like, I really didn't know that. That, I think, is the kind of base that RFK Jr. is cultivating because they're Democrats. These are the fed up Democrats who, you know, are pro-Israel and are tired of Biden. They exist. They're like almost Tulsi crats. Yes, yes. In, in a certain sense, I think that that is true. I, I think that's true. Um, you know, I think RFK has exposure to enough information where that's not an excuse I would make uh, for him. Um, you know, I, I just think what you said 
a few minutes ago says it all. You know, he's committed to running inside a party and inside a two-party system where there is overwhelming bipartisan support for the Israeli government as currently constituted. I mean, just a few weeks ago, we're not talking years ago, just a few weeks ago, less than a few weeks ago, I think two weeks ago, I think we covered this last week or something, um, when Jayapal went out there and said Israel is a racist state, uh, not only was she immediately brought to heel and said, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that, I meant the current government, blah, blah, blah. Then the Republicans pounced on it and they initiated a vote in the House uh, to basically affirm that Israel is not a racist state. And that resolution passed 412 to 9. Right. So, you know, uh, there is overwhelming support in both parties uh, for the wrong side of this issue. And I think, you know, uh, he's just not the kind of guy who at the end of the day uh, is equipped to stand up to them. Um, and uh, but, Jayapal was part of the 412, by the way. Oh, yes. Yeah, she ended yeah. up voting yes. She got yeah. cucked so hard, she didn't even <laughs> vote no when the vote came, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but speaking of standing up, we have uh, another story that we're going to get into. We are going to get to Super Chats, don't worry. And I see Rumble Rants uh, coming in. I don't see any Rumble Rants yet, but I have my Rumble screen on. We have 60 over in the Rumble chat. 294 here in the YouTube chat. Please hit that like button, folks, so we can get some more people in here. We really got to work the algorithm in the morning shows. So thank you guys very much for doing that. Um, this was a story that came in last night, uh, which was really kismet because we had planned, Jose, to have you on the show a few days ago. And turns out there was an intervention of sorts that happened last night at a White House press event. And so here... Uh, is a tweet that came out last night, and it has gone pretty viral uh, already. This mm -hmm. is from Alish Joshi on Twitter. I just mustered up, she says, every ounce of courage to interrupt White House Press Secretary Karim Jean-Pierre and urge the Biden administration to stop approving new coal, oil, and gas projects. The climate crisis is here now. POTUS, listen to Gen Z scientists and frontline communities. Okay, so that was the tweet. Now we're going to play the video of this quote-unquote intervention, and uh, you'll see what we're talking about, uh, putting that in quote marks in just a few minutes. But first, let's see the video that was attached uh, to that tweet. Excuse me for interrupting, but asking nicely hasn't worked out. A million young people wrote to the administration pleading not to approve a disastrous oil drilling project in Alaska, and we were ignored. So I'm here channeling the strength of my ancestors and generation. Will the administration will the administration stop approving new oil and gas projects and align with youth, science, and frontline communities from the north slope of Alaska to Louisiana? I First of all, I appreciate your courage. Thank you. <laughs> and what I'll say to you, and all you have to do, and I know you're speaking about a particular project, and I get that. I understand it's, that. And I, you have approved multiple projects since then, and more at a faster rate than the Trump administration. We need you to act on your campaign promises. Declare Please. a climate emergency. No. Woo! Which side are you on now? Oh, please, please respond. Please respond. I, well, I was trying to, um, and I'm happy to respond. So look, this is an administration, and if you look at this president, if you look at the action that he's taken, he has taken more action on climate change than any other president. He has an ambitious policy. He has. That's and true. That, you know, blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline was the biggest carbon bomb in human history. And so he has taken action. He's also approved the Willow Project, which is the biggest drilling project issued in the history of federal land. So when you're right, you're right. He has taken action. Let's hear the rest. And I don't think you can deny that. I think you could agree with everything that he's put forward and he has done. And there's always more work to be done. He's going to continue to be ambitious. He's going to continue to take action. And that is something that he has promised during his campaign and will continue to do so. I'm happy to have this conversation with you outside of this, outside of this, uh, this, this, uh, this, you know, speaking event at this time. 
but we can talk through. We can talk through all that he has done and all he wants to continue to do. And we can also listen to you and listen to what you have brought forth right now. But it's okay, guys. I don't, I, we should, I want her to, this is. This is, yeah, okay, so you can see there she got pretty good treatment from Corrine Jean-Pierre there. Now, I know a lot of people on Twitter are commending this girl for her courage. And look, you know, uh, we don't want to bully anybody right now, right? We have the censors crawling up our ass, so we want to be very, very respectful. You know, she's a lovely young person. We really believe in her right to get up and say whatever she wants. And so that's all fine. There's This is nothing personal against her. But it is public information here on her Twitter that she is a labor organizer and executive director of Gen Z for Change, current executive director of Gen Z for Change, which is a nonprofit collective of Gen Z activists leveraging the power of social media to drive progressive change. So if we go to Influence Watch, which keeps track of who these different organizations uh, actually are, let's read a little bit about Gen Z for Change. Gen Z for Change is a left-of-center political advocacy organization that promotes Democratic Party campaigns and left-of-center causes through a network of social media influencers who have large online followings. The group was founded as TikTok for Biden. TikTok for Biden, not TikTok for Change. TikTok for Biden during the 2020 election and was organized with the goal of promoting Joe Biden's 2020 presidential campaign on emerging social media platform TikTok. The group since rebranded as Gen Z for Change and continued to lend su support to Democratic campaigns during 2021 U.S. Senate runoff elections in Georgia and the 2021 Virginia gubernatorial race being run by longtime Clinton ally, enemy of the left flank of the party, Terry McAuliffe, by the way. The group also partnered with Anthony Fauci to promote the COVID vaccine rollout <laughs> and worked with Georgia Democratic gubernatorial uh, uh, candidate Stacey Abrams' group, Fair Fight. What a radical organization this is. The group has also become a stakeholder group, a stakeholder group in the Biden administration and made headlines when its influencers received a private briefing from the White House on its response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So here's Elise with Obama. Here's Elise with Bill Clinton, right? Um, no disrespect to her, but she's no Jose Vega, right? This was not the same thing. And we have an expert on interventions here with us today to vet this. You vetted this immediately. Um, and, you know, it seems like what this is uh, is a theatrical presentation of sorts, right? You could say the whole thing was staged to begin with. It may not have been staged literally in the sense that Karine Jean-Pierre knew she was going to stand up, but they obviously let her into the room. They obviously know who this person is. It wasn't like you went in there and stood up and started giving them shit. They obviously know who these people are. They are, they are very, very tight with the White House, so they must obviously be tight with the press team as well, especially since they are a sort of social media, unofficial arm of the White House. That's kind of how they've been serving. And so this was not the organic expression of genuine Gen Z um, unrest. Uh, that it was made out to be, and it has a couple million views. Uh, I suspect the real goal of this is to function as more or less a sheep herding operation where we say, hey, look, you know, the youngsters are making noise. They're making their voices heard. They're expressing dissatisfaction with Biden in certain areas. But look how responsive the White House is. Look how nice they were to her. Look, they're going to pull her in. They're going to have a conversation. They've had numerous conversations. This is a Democrat aligned, insider aligned group um and so you were on this from minute one uh yeah. what's what's your take on that what's your i mean first of all um i would like to get your take on the difference between how she was received and how you would have been received if you had stood up and made a similar argument now you wouldn't have made a similar argument you're a lot louder than, than she would have been KJP but uh, herself I'll grant that. would have what a kjp would have herself came down from the stage and tackled me to the ground I, <laughs> I think um i don't know how to even begin to kind of take this down. you have to well first I'll, I'll talk about the effect that i think this is going to have versus the interventions that kynan and i have had the interventions that kynan and i have had have gone viral internationally 
And the reason that's important is because the message we try to put out there is an international message that, that we attempt to resonate with the world. And it does resonate with the world because we, ex I like to think, we're expressing a frustration that the entire world sees, not just with the United States, but with the entire Western kind of orientation around bullying other countries around the world. This is only going to go viral here domestically. I don't think China cares. I don't think Russia certainly doesn't care about any kind of propaganda that makes the White House look good. See, because that's what this is, right? The White House knows about the power of the kind of anti-establishment messaging, right? And they don't right. even need to see me and Kynan and others to know that kind of effect because they saw it in AOC, right? AOC's whole anti-establishment taking out the corrupt, um, you know, establishment Democrat, that worked, that got her in to that position of power, you know? I don't believe they, they wanted her in, they got her in and they corrupted her, boom, that's it, end of story with her. <clears throat> so they know that they're losing the Gen Z vote. They know that they're not looking good. They know that the popularity with Biden is dropping. So they needed to come up with a way to say, OK, well, how do we make the Biden administration look good while acknowledging the frustration that exists with our voter base while still coming out on top? Right. Exactly. <laughs> it's not a hard thing to kind of think about. And so whoever the, the the marketing person was who did this right must have had some kind of degree in marketing and probably worked for uh, OSS or something, you know, because like they're saying, no, let's take the interventions that have gone viral and let's make one ourselves. Now, coming to her personally, she probably didn't know that. Um, how do I put this? She was probably nudged by some upper level person in her team or somebody on KJP's team who took her to the side and said, hey, you should like stand up and do this. Like, let's talk about this. Yeah, just, just say these points, do it. Yeah, it can go viral. It'll really like show, you know, what what um, what the Biden administration is lacking and why Gen Z is so powerful. And she probably took it around with it. So I do believe she believes what she said. She probably wasn't in on it in the sense that like, she was like, okay, we're gonna stage this and go viral because of everything I just said. She probably wasn't on that end. He was just probably told, you should do this because it's gonna make Gen Z look really good. And she did. Um, and so I do believe she was sincere in what she did, but no, nah, man, this whole thing reeks of like a uh, psyop of trying to use the method that um, has been popularized in the last year to try and make the White House look good. And I think, um, what she needs is to be exposed like what you did with showing the pictures of the obama her meeting obama and others and then there's more too i mean she's been to the white house countless times right oh yeah she no absolutely and listen we're, we're not we're not picking on her we're just talking about the organization right gen <clears throat> z for change started out as TikTokers for biden this is a pro biden yeah. influencer organization they've been to the white house several times they've been in comms meetings with the white house about the ukraine war which, you know, look, Jimmy has talked about this. A lot in our space have talked about this. I don't want to take credit for this idea. But if you're not a dissenter on that, you have no credibility on climate. Uh, you know, and that, look, first of all, <laughs> the United States military is the number one polluter uh, in the world as, a, as its own institution. That's number one. Number two, the Nord Stream pipeline, which you have spoken a lot about, Jose, and yeah. you have busted a lot of balls about, uh, that was the greatest carbon bomb in human history. The methane gas that was released from that was more than any other human-caused event in the history of the world. So you add the Willow Project plus Nord Stream, you're talking about a climate record that is perhaps even worse than George W. Bush's climate <laughs> record. The Bush White House, which censored its own EPA to take the words climate change out of the reports. People don't remember that the Bush administration did that because the story broke in July and August of 2001, six weeks before they got a convenient distraction from that, right? Obviously. But this could perhaps be worse than that. I mean, he could not only be a disappointing climate president, he is perhaps the worst climate president in history. And so how do they clean that up? 
How do they clean that up? They clean that up by what? The same way Obama, you know, tried to restore hope and change. It wasn't by doing anything, but by bearing witness, right? I bear witness to the plight of the workers. I understand. I feel your pain. That was Bill Clinton's thing. I feel your pain, right? I feel your pain. What are we going to do? We're going to hear you out, Gen Z. We're going to hear you out, yeah. right? And so it makes the White House look good that, you know, uh, Corrine didn't didn't boot her out of the room, you know. Uh, you know, she, she's this sort of mild-mannered girl. She stands up. She gives a very dignified presentation. And the White House says, yeah, no, we'll talk. We'll talk. We'll talk. Um, it makes the Biden White House look good. And I think that was by design. I think you're right. It's it's hard not to reach that conclusion, given what we know about the organization. Literally started TikTokers for Biden. Yeah, Kynan said that if this was not a staged intervention, right? Like if it really was an organic thing, it was a missed opportunity because she could have said, you know, we won't endorse the White House unless they do something for addressing climate change. I mean, that's what makes me think it was at least staged in the sense that we're talking about, right? Was it staged in the in the fact that she knew exactly mm-hmm. how Jean Pierre was going to react? No, but it was that definitely staged to to a certain extent. To, to, like right. they each knew who the other person was. They were nobody was caught completely off guard by this, and uh, the the White House press team knew how they were supposed to take this. And they took it that way. Whereas if somebody comes in there and actually catches them off guard the way you would, I mean, you'd have been dragged out of there. Like you've been dragged out of all of these. And they don't say anything either. They don't say, well, I appreciate your courageous stance. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, right. And then the and then the worst part was the reactions from other people. This guy, Maxwell Frost, I just like, I love him so much. I'm trying to my best to make sure you stay monetized. <laughs> I, I love him so much. We have to be very positive. We have to pivot to it. We have to do a more positive messaging on the show now. <laughs> He's such a great congressman. You know, he put something out. He said, like, yeah, man, I really like this action that they took. You know, this is the kind of fire and fury. No, what he, he said, um, speaking truth to power is often not easy. So I definitely encourage this kind of action we all should be like at least it's like you know i'm, I'm yeah. trying <laughs> exactly hey what am i over here what am yeah. I- <laughs> exactly exactly no you don't get the same treatment uh not surprising at all not surprising someone, at all someone sent me a text message that said uh it was like a kid in the back seat of the car talking to the mom and it says like can we have jose vega and then the mom says we have jose vega at home and then, uh, and then in the next frame was just Jose Vega at home, and it's just the the intervention we saw. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Patrick Donahue, thanks for the ten euro, my friend. Rest in peace to Sinead O'Connor. Yes, a true advocate for the poor in Ireland and abroad. We mentioned her on the top of last show. Absolutely, she was one of the few who spoke out against the British occupation of Ireland, and for that, she has my love and respect. Rest in peace. Yes, died too young, fifty six years old. Uh, her, her kid died the year before. Um, and so, you know, that that can do it to a person. I don't know how she died. I haven't looked into how, but yeah, too young for sure. The Willie Bragg show. Thanks, Willie. I thought you were live this morning, Willie. What happened? Did your show wrap up and you came over here? Uh, but thank you for the five bucks, my friend. I appreciate it. A is for David Axelrod. O is for Barack Obama. And of course, C is for Bill and Hillary Clinton. Yeah. What does it spell? AOC. Indeed. Um, yeah. Jose has these war posters uh, for AOC that we actually want to uh, promote. Um, I'm going to try and come up with a graphic. Jose, do you have a link you can put in the private chat so I can show that graphic? So maybe we can move uh, some of these for you, if you do. I see if you... Twitter DM. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, that'll work. That'll work. See if we can move some product. To the... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> please. Like I said, you know, all the proceeds will go to the um, to the rally uh, because we do need uh, just a couple more hundred dollars to help uh, pay for some of the because we're having so that we have the rally and then there's the post rally concert also. So we're having a, a requiem. Um, and I'll be singing in the Requiem, too. I will be, I'm a bass, a baritone in it. Baritone, so. beautiful. Yeah, so I will be singing. That was a baritone. Yeah, the uh, Mozart Requiem, not not as a soloist, just in the chorus. Um, and, uh, and you know, we, we have, you know, just some expenses, you know, rental space and stuff that, that still needs to be paid for. So whether you buy a poster, which I DM'd you just now, um, the AOC War poster, whether you buy one, 
um, or many. Um, or if you just donate directly, if you go to my Twitter, my cash app is there. All of the proceeds will go right to the um, right to the concert. So beautiful. I'll bring that up in just a second because it's related to the answer of the super chat here. So the people at Infinite, thank you for the ten dollars. Appreciate that, my friend. Oh no, I'm seeing a lot of AOC War poster T-shirts online. These all from Jose? I don't know. Did somebody no. cop your design? Which is the official site to purchase to support you? Love DD, Killing a Keaton. Thank you very much. Tell Russell we're still headbang at 666. I don't know if we're going to make 666. 666 is hard to make in the morning shows, right? We're up against the algorithms. If you want a 666, pardon me, right. hit that like button. We, we, we got uh, almost 300 people that we got to get in here before we can give you that. But what we can give you, my friend, um, is the link to the AOC war posters. Yes. So there yeah. it is. <laughs> the t-shirts the, the etsy link is on that twitter link that's the give, I'll, I'll give it don't worry i got it yeah the, um greg or big mad crab on twitter who's part of the inn crew made this poster after him and i were discussing some ideas to go after aoc for and i don't know if you you covered it on the show but like my friends and i visited aoc's office with these posters we slid one under the door we taped it to her door um it was a lot of fun it was pretty funny and uh uh, he made this poster, so, you know, it's the poster that's gone around the world. I, I really, really like it. And the answer yeah, to that question on the, on the T-shirts, no, we don't have an official T-shirt. The reason that we don't is because to make them on demand, they're, like, really expensive. They're, like, almost 40 bucks to make a profit on them. And yeah. I don't want to do that. I want to make them as cheap as possible. So I wanted to buy them in bulk and then do the shipping ourselves. But just to get that started, it's, like, eleven twelve hundred dollars just to do that you know and yeah then, no uh, it's it's brutal it's brutal we just got our merch stuff online we just did so by the way that's another related plug which i'll let me get yours done first here so the etsy uh dot com listing is here uh if you want to buy that um here's the etsy listing um, which I will put in the description of this video as soon as we are done here. Um, so you could just go on Etsy and buy it from there. And uh, $18, it's a very reasonable price there. So good on you for that. And uh, that's how you can get the AOC war poster. And that money all goes uh, to a good cause. Um, but yeah, we just brought our, we use a site called Creator Spring where they do all the printing of the merch on demand and the shipping and stuff like that. And it does cost a lot of money. You don't really make much of a profit off of them unless you charge a lot. I mean, we have our t-shirts are going to come online soon for 30 bucks a piece. And so we make about 10 on that because, you know, you have to pay to print on demand and then they ship yeah. it for you and everything. So it's a pain. But uh, if you are signed up at a Patreon tier, the $15 or the $30 a month tier or the $50 a month tier obviously does get you uh, a t-shirt and so we do have those online we shipped out our first batch of them now we ordered them they'll be shipping out uh first week of august so those are on their way to you folks and we appreciate your patience because i i feel i feel what you're saying it's hard to find a vendor that can do them inexpensively enough where you don't have to charge 40 to 50 dollars a t-shirt i mean some yeah, of these exactly. t-shirts that these creators go they're super expensive and you think why are you ripping me off for a t-shirt you some socialist podcast it's like well they cost 25 dollars to make and ship yeah you know yeah. what i mean that's why yeah yeah exactly exactly so you know anything that and if people want to give me the seed money you know greg wants to buy his own printer and then like start up a business here in my apartment so you want to give me the seed money to buy our own shirt printing Thirteen hundred dollars. My cash app is open, so you know, just make sure it says for printer, and uh, and and I won't give it to the concert. I'll give it to the for, for Greg, so we can get this started. And you know what? Maybe we could even do your printing merch and stuff at a discount rate. I would love that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that that could be a great uh, that could be a great thing. We we'll, we will talk about that. Hey, by the way, where's the where's the concert at? The concert is at All Souls Church. I I, I think I have a poster for that too. The concert's at All Souls Church. It's on 80th and Lexington, so it's not that far from. Okay, the, it's not that far. A couple miles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, here we go. I think uh, let's. You do guys it. should do a march to the concert since you got to walk a couple miles to get there anyway. Thirty-three blocks, right? Yeah, that's not too. That's not too bad. We'll see. We'll see how hot it is. We'll see how. Hot that's true. It could be hot. <laughs> okay. It could be hot. It could be stormy. It's been a horrible, miserable, rainy, stormy, hot as hell summer. Really has been brutal up here in the Northeast. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a. Uh, it's I don't know what's going on. We need more rain. I need. Mean, that's what I like. <laughs> yeah. 
Aaron, uh, I'm sorry, Arpoon Wavy. My apologies. Uh, thanks for the 9.99. Happy payday, dissidents. Love y'all. Have a lovely weekend. Love your work, Jose. Yes, we all love yeah. Jose's work. Thank you very much for that. Our paydays here are the first and the twenty-first uh, of every month. Patreon hits on the first. YouTube hits on the twenty-first. That's it. Fridays, no paydays for us. It's my wife's payday, so I get to uh, mooch off of her a little bit this afternoon. Get a pizza or something. <laughs> Uh, Martin, thank you for that very generous donation, forty nine ninety nine. That's enough for a singing bowl ring, but we are without Russell, and so we are without a singing bowl. You're stuck with the less spiritual uh, of the two hosts uh, <laughs> today, and so I have no singing bowl for you, but I owe you one. Thank you very much. That's very, very kind of you folks. Super Chats are super helpful. They are what make these morning streams possible. That is absolutely true. That is what allows me to ditch the car and not deliver DoorDash and instead come on here. So thank you guys all very much for that. And once again, uh, we just want to go ahead, Jose. I just wanted to say, yeah, you thank you for reminding me it's payday. My wife's boyfriend's going to give me my allowance for the day. So I'm really happy. <laughs> <laughs> I should have mentioned that earlier. I ought to put you in a better mood. I didn't know. I didn't know that about you. If I did, I would have mentioned that at the top. So we'd have, you know, started out with a bit more pep. That's right. I can go to step. Lego World while he pipes my wife all day. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, that Lego World, have you been to Lego World? I've been outside Lego World. I've never been in it. Oh, okay. Because Lego, the, the Lego Land right there, that's uh, in Monroe. That's right where near where I used to live. Now I live far, further north, but I used to live right near Lego Land, actually. <laughs> I see. Got out just before the traffic got got bad. Um, yeah, <laughs> so enjoy Lego World this weekend. I don't know. I hope the weather uh, holds up for you. It's <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny. Um, so, folks, I just want to mention one more time. Like we said, we had a great Patreon drive uh, last time, and we have another Patreon drive that I'll make. Right now, you can support the show by going to patreon.com front slash do dissidents. It really does help us a great deal. When you sign up at patreon.com front slash do dissidents, you get your name up in lights. We have more names added to the scroll today because thank you guys so much for stepping up. You guys really did step up, and we had over a dozen signups on the heels of the previous show. That is great. We really, really thank you very much for that. It is super, super helpful. That is how you censor proof. The operation on our next defense, the next time we step out of line, which a couple of rowdy Jew boys that we are, we tend to step out of line. Um, we will go dark for a week. We hope that never happens, but it might. And so it's very, very important. If you can support us on Patreon, that helps us uh, be certain that we have a show no matter what happens on these various tech platforms that we operate uh, at the mercy of. Uh, and also, if you sign up at dodissidents.substack.com, which dozens of you guys did, we had a lot of free Substack uh, subscribers on the heels of that show, which is super important as well. If you sign up at dodissidents.substack.com, even if you can't sign up as a paid member, if you sign up as a free member, that gives us a means to get in touch with you um, so that you know when and where we're going live because there are going to be some shows in the future whether we get disciplined by YouTube or not there's going to be some shows in the future that we're going to do exclusively on Rumble when you sign up as a paid subscriber you get access to two subscriber exclusive streams per month our next one is going to be this Monday July 31st, and that is going to be a banger. We have Anthony Weiner freaking out at the mention of the Clinton thrill list, we'll call it here. Uh, we also have the new Facebook files, which just dropped, which we are going to be covering uh, on Monday. Uh, and we have a couple other great topics as well. So those are kind of uncensored shows where we can explore topics that we can explore here in uh, the East Berlin-esque YouTube space. Um, and so if you can do that, it really, really helps us. And this next upcoming patron show is going to be a really, really fun one. Uh, a lot of really, really juicy topics to get into. Taddy Mason over on Rumble gave us a Rumble rant. Thank you, Taddy Mason. We appreciate that very much. I'm just going to read it here since we are without our producer volunteer, Jake, since he can't do the morning shows because he obviously has a real job, unlike us. Uh, so Taddy Mason says, can we replace the hold them accountable terminology when talking about politicians with something like take disciplinary action instead? Yes, use the language of manager to employee against them. 
That is a good point. That is a good point. I like that idea because hold them accountable means what? That means doing what this girl did here, which is stand up and voice your frustration. The Sunrise Movement tweeted that out. The Sunrise Movement was very, very quick to bend the knee to Biden in the 2020 cycle, which was really disappointing to me because part of the rationale I thought for that second Bernie campaign was to build up institutions that can then wield power against the Democratic Party, even if and when Bernie loses. So when I phone banked for the Bernie campaign in 2020, I didn't phone bank through the official campaign. I picked one of those organizations. I picked the Sunrise Movement. Once they endorsed Bernie, they started phone banking for him. And that's where I phone banked because I thought, OK, this way, even if Bernie loses, even when they screw him, we'll have this thing. And then that thing immediately, almost instantly acquiesced and started jockeying for position inside or adjacent to, right, in this case, the Biden White House. Uh, this is our third patron scroll. Our new names are up in lights on the end of this scroll. So congratulations and thank you all so, so much for signing up at Patreon. It really, really helps a tremendous amount. Dave Delarai, thanks for the $12 super chat. Looking forward to the upcoming doc, guys. No one is doing what Jose and Kynan are, except for the OG Blumenthal. Keep it going. Yes. Uh, well, once we get this new footage on the 6th, I'll really be able to finalize the uh, timeline. Our composer is back from vacation on August 8th, so we are going to be putting it together very, very quickly after this next weekend. So we should have uh, significant updates on that very, very soon, and we are looking forward to it. Are we doing well. like a premiere? Is there like, are we going to go to we're running out of theater for this? Well, that's what we're thinking of doing. I was thinking about seeing if the People's Forum wanted to host it because Russell knows the guys over there. They have a great space. I think they're on like 37th and 6th or something like that. It's right in Midtown. And they have a great room, and I'm sure they have a movie screen there. And so maybe we could do a premiere there and then do an online premiere after that. We'll have to figure out what the rollout is going to be. But yeah, oh, I would yeah. like to do a screening in New York. I'm sure we could pack it because we have a lot of viewers and listeners in the New York City area. You're from New York. Kynan's from New York. That whole base yeah. is from New York. And so I would love to do a, an in-person showing. Absolutely. We can invite Katie Halpert you know, to come on in, maybe make us all some martinis and... <laughs> right now, she, she she could bartend. We can have Katie Howe for bartend the event. That would be great. That'd I love be great. her. I hope she doesn't. I I, I love her. I, I I don't care. I love her. I love her. I hope she she takes that in good stride if she ever sees this. Hey, yeah. No. Listen. I we don't we don't have really anything against Halper either. We just thought it was funny that she was talking about class politics <laughs> while <laughs> chomping an olive out of the martini. I thought that was, and you know. I think she has a good enough sense of humor where she probably, in retrospect, appreciates the irony of that as well. Um, all right, let's move on to our third topic of the day here, folks. Moving right along, please hit that like button and please hit that subscribe button. Uh, the Washington Post is having money problems, folks. Now, the Washington Post can sustain these money problems because they are owned uh, by what now is, what is he, the second richest, third richest, well, anyway, one of the top five richest people uh, in the world. But this is a New York Times report. A decade ago, Jeff Bezos bought a newspaper. Now he's paying attention to it again. So Bezos bought the Washington Post in 2013. And they kind of buried the lead here because a lot of other outlets that jumped on this report jumped on this paragraph right here. Pardon me. The Post is on pace to lose about $100 million in 2023, <clears throat> according to two people with knowledge of the company's finances. Two other people briefed on the situation said the company was expecting to miss its forecast for ad revenue this year. They spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss internal financial matters. The Post has struggled to increase the number of its paying customers since the 2020 election when its digital subscriptions peaked at $3 million. It now has about 2.5 million. So that is obviously 500,000 lost subscriptions there. Uh, that is uh, quite significant. Uh, Bezos's purchase of the Washington Post ended decades of ownership by the Graham family, which had steered the paper through its legendary coverage of Watergate and the Pentagon Papers. The Graham family had that paper since 1946, so they owned it for more than half a century up until Bezos bought it and signified a new era of expansion under one of the world's most famous entrepreneurs. 
In a meeting with staff shortly after his purchase, Mr. Bezos encouraged Post employees to experiment digitally, taking advantage of the, quote, gifts of the Internet, such as global reach, that had made Amazon a stunning success. He provided ample financial support to expand the newsroom. Mr. Bezos weighed in on product uh, decisions and hired Fred Ryan, former chief executive of Politico, to serve as publisher to replace Catherine Weymouth, a scion of the Graham family. He kept Mr. Barron in place as the Post's top editor until his retirement in 2021, frequently referring to him as the best journalism tutor an owner could ask for. He helped choose Sally Busby as a successor to Mr. Barron, inviting her to his home in Washington's upscale Calorama neighborhood. Uh, in January, Jeff Bezos made a rare appearance uh, in the newsroom. He sat in on a morning news meeting, and later in the day, he met with a handful of Post journalists. During some of his gatherings, several Post employees expressed concerns about Fred Ryan's missteps and the direction of the paper. In June, Mr. Ryan announced his resignation telling employees that he planned to start the Center on Public Civility, a new project by the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation, where he is chairman of the board. And this is an interesting piece of this as well. Mr. Bezos has personally weighed in on an experimental project being developed for the Post's opinion section, which is being run by the editorial page editor David Shipley, a former Bloomberg editor he helped recruit. The initiative, which doesn't yet have an official name, is exploring a forum for readers, this is interesting, in cities across the United States to submit their own opinions and commentary. So what it sounds like is he's going to try and turn the Washington Post website into a more social media type atmosphere where the people can actually post their editorials, their Ooh. essays, and share them around which is very interesting because, number one, I actually think that's not a bad idea, but it definitely cuts against the narrative from a lot of these establishment outlets, including the New York Times and, of course, the Washington Post, um, that they know what's best and that they have to control narratives. And now you see that model is starting to tank a little bit, partly because trust in media is eroding, but also partly because a lot of their base went back to brunch once Biden won and they became less interested in the news. But now you're seeing Bezos saying, hey, maybe we should adapt more of a social media type interactive forum like project. And we'll see what happens when people start posting opinion pieces on the Washington Post's website, if and when that takes off, how free that discourse will be. Because I know for sure, if they start putting shit up there, that gives outlets like ours an opportunity to actually go on and post stuff in a forum where you might hope uh, to open up some eyes, right? Like, what if we could post our content in a Washington Post social media type forum? That gives sure. us a chance to get our message through to some of the most brainwashed people uh, in the world and hopefully, uh, you know, break them out of their hypnosis. Well, it sounded like Substack to me. That's the first thing that came to my mind. Like, is this like a Bezos own Substack? Is that the idea? Um, I mean, I do like that idea, but will the people who actually read the Washington Post, first of all, evolve in a depth? I mean... Can people even trust something that is owned by the Washington Post, the social media owned by Jeff Bezos? I mean, I guess people trust Elon Musk to, to do it. Um, I don't know. I'm just curious how this concept would be. Uh, but I think overall what you read in the article is that nobody actually, like I said, the, the, the media is dying. You know, as I told them to their face, you know, nobody wants to read your shitty articles anymore. So in a loving way. Well, here, let's them. see it. It's funny because I did pull that because I knew it would be relevant to this segment. So here is your intervention. Do you want to set this up? I'm sure you know what we're talking about here. The lecture hall with yeah. Seymour Hirsch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one. Uh, sure. So that's the, at, on the stage, this was at Columbia School of Journalism here in New York. On the stage, you have the executive editor of the New York Times, Reuters, uh, I think, uh, what's her name? Oh, Sally Busby who was Washington Post, yep, who was referenced in the article we just um, we were just reading, um, and some lady from the LA Times and Reuters and stuff, and then there's Joe Capehart moderating the actual thing. Um, and also there were other journalists in the audience too, like my favorite uh, Mishka, not Mishka, uh, Masha Gessen, there we go. I was thinking of the Jimmy Dore producer. 
Mr. Kapali, and Masha Gessen is also there in the audience. And uh, yeah, and, and then, well, you know, this is what I tell them. All right, here we go. Oh, is this the lecture hall with Seymour Hirsch? I, I just, I'm looking for the one with Seymour Hirsch because it's a policy and press hall event. So shouldn't we be talking about the Nord Stream since that's the biggest story of the century? And you guys, you know, I mean, you have the executive editor of the New York Times there who came out with a phony story to try and block Seymour Hirsch. It just, it's just kind of funny how that happened, you know? I mean, did you even acknowledge Seymour Hirsch? All of you are executive editors of papers that broke Pentagon, Me Lai, Watergate. Is this the same papers or not? I mean, is there anything you've gotten right in the last 20 years or am I mistaken about that? I mean, it's just kind of funny because Iraq, wrong. Syria, wrong. Russiagate, really wrong. Okay, I mean, the list goes on and on. So the last thing you could do to try and actually fix your reputation is acknowledge that through leaks, we had to find out that Zelensky was going to bomb Moscow on the anniversary. I mean, if you're so impartial, shouldn't you at least say, right, that Zelensky was going to bring us on the verge of World War III? That seems pretty fair. While Julian Assange rots in prison, all of you've got, you know, fat checks because he's in jail for doing your job. And you know what, Tucker Carlson ain't no Seymour Hirsch, but he did something you guys are scared to do, speak the truth and actually be critical of the war, which is why he was actually fired from Fox, because you are all cowards, every single one of you. None of you have actually had any relevancy. And you know what, the mainstream press is now dying. Nobody's ever going to listen to you again. You have no credibility with the public. The only people who care about what you have to say are elite assholes who have nothing productive to say anymore. Like those and it's dying off. So will you at least say something either about Nord Stream or Ukraine or the fact that Zelensky brought us to the verge of World War III and the only reason we knew about that was through leaks? I'm, go ahead. It's a free Nothing. speech event, right? You guys are the press. Well, look, Let's that's say- exactly the response you get. What do I always say? I, you know, people have said in the audience they want us to really trademark and get trending that that phrase, the liberal cat stare. Whereas when you start talking sense to them, when you start talking real things, you don't get a response. You get what they gave you just there. You yeah. said you want to. Do you have anything to say about Seymour Hirsch? Mm-hmm. That's it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's it. Nancy <laughs> that's Pelosi is a is a master at that stare where she just looks at you and smiles. You know? Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right, we'll play the rest of this. Say something here. Okay, bye, Mr. Khan, come bye, on. Asshole. You know, you're the executive head of the New York Times, you know? <laughs> I'm just trying to get into some good trouble here, man. Ooh, listen, Karen, get out of my face for a second. I got to talk to these gentlemen. <laughs> well, I just want to hear what they have to say. Go ahead. I'm done. <laughs> Now they said wait your turn. Were there questions at this event, or did you did you not know that? Was that not clear? I it was not clear, and I did not know that. I don't. When I interrupted, um, when I walked in there, I was actually like five minutes late. Kynan and, and the other guy were in there, and uh, Kynan was like, "Come on, man, you know you're late. You're gonna miss the thing." And, I was like, okay. <laughs> and then we. we uh, we, we actually had something to get to, so like, I think we were like, well, we can't stay for too long, so let's just get this over with now. I mean, this will be better if, than if we just ask a question. So, And the fact that they let me speak for so damn long, too. I mean, as you'll notice, like I found this out later. The reason why the guy who takes me out is the dean of Columbia School of Journalism, the reason he takes me out is because the police are legally, or not the police, but campus security the guy you see in the police hat there is not actually a cop. He's a rent-a-cop for Columbia Security. Okay. He is legally not allowed to put his hands on me. But the dean of Columbia School of Journalism didn't care and said, fuck it, I'm going to take this into my own hands. I'm just going to take him out of here, which was illegal. I could have sued him. I don't have the money to sue him. This guy has money and resources, okay? And it wasn't It wasn't even worth, you know, it's... It doesn't let's move those either. posters. Let's move those posters. Let's, let's, yeah, get, a let's legal get those defense posters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fund Jose's legal case against Columbia. <laughs> Indeed. You could you could project if we can. Yeah. So thank you. 
All right. I do think that we need to give uh, our moderator a chance to ask other questions. We're on the verge of World War III. Say something about this bombing. We blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Listen, don't stand there while there are people rotting in prison. Nobody said anything about Uhuru, right? The socialists who are in jail for being critical of this war. God damn it. At least say something about the people in jail for being critical of this war. They don't deserve to be in prison right now. There you go. That was one of your best. I mean, you have a lot of them now, but that was really one of your best ones. Good, good times. Yeah, you know, ever since then, they don't let me in anymore to anywhere. The, you know, I thought it was funny that the New York Post thought it enough of a story to write about the fact that Kynan and I couldn't get in to an AOC town hall that they barred us out. And so, you know, this is also why I encourage other people to go do this. Hey, Jamal Bowman, two days from now, I'm not going to go. I'm not because one, I'm not going to, I mean, I might go in the front and then just complain about not getting in. But look, Jamal Bowman, two days from now is having a talk in Yonkers. Okay. Oh yeah. I don't have a van anymore. Also, that's the other thing. I don't have a, a car anymore, so I can't, I can't drive up there, but somebody's in the Yonkers area or in the Northern Bronx area who can, has a car who can go, go and say hi to your favorite congressman and talk to him about the fact that they are challenged. He's being challenged for, for them, for prime. He's being primary. Somebody is challenging him there. They IPAC has a, a candidate they're running who is challenging Bowman right now. This is the loyalty that the democratic party has. And nobody has been more of a uh, mouthpiece for Biden than Jamal Bowman. Okay. He's been doing his best. He tells people, Get the old man across the finish line. Come on, we got to vote yep. for Biden, folks. Nobody's been more of a cheerleader for the Democratic Party than Bowman. And they say, you know what? You're gone, kid. You're out of here. You're done. That's what they're doing at Bowman. And he's like, somebody's got to wake him up to the fact that he's um, he's 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 just a, a, a servant to them. That they're going to kick to the curb. I digress. Well, it's interesting because, you know, we did a story about uh, a week and a half ago that Justice Democrats is having trouble fundraising and Russell, you know, made a good point that, you know, some of these progressives are going to be vulnerable if they can't raise money through these packs anymore. I don't think AOC will be vulnerable because she's got the huge name ID. Uh, Rashida Tlaib is extremely popular in her district, so she'll probably be safe. But you look at someone like uh, an Ilhan Omar who narrowly won her last primary by single digits, mid single digits. I think she won it by four points in the final count. Uh, and then you look at someone like Bowman. I don't know what his fundraising numbers are through his own campaign or what his poll numbers are in his district. But some of these candidates could be vulnerable if those packs fall apart as they very much deserve to have fallen apart because they have failed to deliver uh, on what they promised uh but but that is interesting that he is facing a primary oops sorry nope. did nope. you cut out for a second i'm here i hear you okay can everybody hear me all right like i said my my internet is very very wonky this morning i, I apologize you. you're fine okay there we go um so yeah so um so, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that, uh, you know, you're seeing a primary to him. Uh, did you see the video that Randy Credico put up saying he's going to challenge AOC? That's funny. Yeah. I mean, he's a perennial candidate, right? Didn't he say he was running for mayor? I mean, he's he's a jokester in a lot of ways, but he's great. He's a lot of fun. I, I would actually love to interview Randy Credico. I don't know how serious he is. I mean, he did say he's looking for an election lawyer, which says he intends to run. I don't exactly know what his objective is. Is he thinking he's going to win against AOC? I don't no, know he can't. That. He can't. She's too powerful now. This is what happens. This is why we say she's the next Nancy Pelosi, well, because when, well, once you get a certain fame, um, you know, you become untouchable through that. And I, actually, I personally think AOC is untouchable now. I don't think the, that she could be successfully primaried. Well, no, I don't know about that, because the, the, you, could see, you can't see these things as singularities. right? So the Bowman's getting challenged. And then the New Yorker or the New York mag put out an article that you covered. AOC yep. is just another Democrat, right? Okay, so these things are happening simultaneously. They're, they're going after the squad one way or another, but the AOC thing, I think, is the fact that you're right about that. I do think she is untouchable. 
Because I think AOC made a deal with somebody on the inside and said, listen, we'll make you a senator if you just shut up and don't talk anything bad about Biden. Okay, or if you endorse Biden, we will make you a senator. I think that's genuinely the deal they, they, they've got with AOC right now. Um, Let me tell you, if that is the deal, and, you know, I don't know that it isn't. I know a lot of people have speculated that. There's been a lot of speculation about her making a run for Senate. Uh, first of all, I don't think she would have any chance at all of successfully primarying either Gillibrand or Schumer. Um, and I'm not sure that she could even win a general election Senate race in New York. New York, as Russell has said a million times, and I have echoed, um, New York is not a progressive state. New York is very much a Rockefeller Republican state with liberal social values. And so uh, I don't think AOC would be a very easy sell to New York State. I don't think she would win New York City by all that big a margin, and she would get absolutely creamed everywhere north of New York, and certainly uh, east of New York. She would not go well over in Nassau or Suffolk County, Long Island, I can tell you that <laughs> for absolute certainty. I don't think she could win a statewide race. I would bet on the Republican to win that race. I honestly would. Because I don't think New York is this sort of progressive place. It's it's the home of Wall Street. It's the home of neoliberalism. Um, these are, you know, Rockefeller Republicans with liberal social views. So that when they get the nanny pregnant, the nanny can get the pregnancy taken care of. Right? I mean, that's, that's, that's New York. Right? <laughs> that, that's a lot of New York. And everywhere else is red. Almost everywhere else is red. And so I don't think AOC could win a, a statewide Senate race. So if that is the deal, I think it's a bad deal for her to take. I think you're I think you're right. I mean, well, the last Senate race, which I know because I helped the candidate run independent, yep. was Joe Joe Pinion was the Republican challenger for Chuck Schumer, and he only got like fifteen percent of the vote and he was just a complete idiot. But I think you're right that if AOC were to announce she's challenging like let's say she does beat Chuck Schumer or Chuck Schumer decides to retire because the next time he's up for reelection, he'll be seventy eight, seventy nine years old. Uh, so it's possible he might retire, or maybe not. I mean, I'm sure we'll get to it with the with the. We are. Problem. That's our final but, segment of the day. Yeah, yeah. but but uh, you know, if she did decide, like you know what, I'm going, and and she did win the general, it would galvanize the Republicans to put somebody up competent, um, to 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 actually you know best her in a in a Senate race. Yeah. No, I don't think she could win a statewide Senate race. Um, we're going to go slightly out of order with Super Chats just because this guy says he's got to go. So I want uh, you to get to respond to him because he says can't stay but want to say huge respect to Jose. Thank you so much for your activism. You're probably the only glimpse of truth these elites encounter. So there you go. Oh, I, just want to I appreciate that. I'm sorry you have to go early, but uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, I hope to see you at the rally if you can show up. Indeed. Indeed. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. We'll take a couple more of these chats here. Uh, oops. What happened? I had one from James Vanderzanden and it went away. Where the hell did that one go? Uh, oh, James Vanderzanden, your super chat disappeared on me. I had it queued and it erased. Hold on, I'm going to go find it. I did not forget you, my friend. There it is. James, uh, who's one of the OG dissident supporters, by the way, one of our first Patreon members way back, we were just a little audio show and blog site, uh, WordPress blog and an audio podcast. Thanks for the $4.99, my friend. Holding them accountable by giving corrupt politicians and parties what they want, your vote and support, seems like a dumb, dumb move, grow up, and them exit. Yep, indeed. Agree with that wholeheartedly, my friend. The Long Drop is a member. You can join on YouTube by becoming a member. Hit that Join button, which is next to that Subscribe button. They say, guys, it's a lot easier for them to detect threats by giving it a social media type format. That is true. They can sort of monitor people more uh, th thoroughly if they open it up to actual feedback, but I think I think Bezos is trying to make that more of a tech platform. I think that's the overall trend in a lot of media spaces, even printed word. Um, and I think that's that's what uh, they're looking to do there. But good observation, and thank you for the message. Bennett Weiss, that's my dad. Jose met my dad, right? You met him at a yeah, diner yeah, somewhere? Yeah. At a, a, one of the, was that at an RFK rally, actually? Did you, no, where, was, where well, was that? Oh, well, actually, I met him twice. Yeah, once at a, it wasn't an RFK rally. It was a, uh, it was a peace rally where Dennis Kucinich spoke. For That's right, RFK. where he was speaking. Right, exactly. The first time I met your dad was when we intervened on a Republican guy. Oh, really? I didn't know you met him twice. He didn't tell me about that. He only told me about the one time. 
But he says, see you at the rally. And of course, there should be a million of us there, but don't worry about the other 999,000. 999, just make sure you are there. Yes, everybody should be at that rally. If you can make it, I'll be there uh, filming and hanging out, and it should be quite a lot of fun. We hope the uh, temperature works out for us. We hope we don't melt out there, but we will be there. Rain, shine, or heat, whatever. We will brave the elements. Temporal police, thank you for the 499. We appreciate that. Very, very much. All right, we'll, we'll take it. Up a, uh, we'll set up a dude dissident. Meet, meet Keaton Weiss from dude dissident. <laughs> set, up, set up a tent and a boot. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You can charge people for a picture and a flyer or something. Like <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. $25 autographs and, and photos. Have a, have, a, have a Polaroid camera. I'll be signing Polaroid photos out there. That'd be fun. Um, all right, we got one more story for you guys this morning. Uh, this is, uh, I would say this is a lighthearted story, but this really does speak uh, to the end of Empire. Um, the word gerontocracy was trending online a couple of days ago on the heels of not one, but two examples of our senior most duopoly gatekeepers uh, having some pretty alarming moments uh, in pretty high-profile places. So here is first one that you've probably seen before. This is Mitch McConnell. Of, uh... Just freezes. People are saying he's having a seizure here. Apparently, to have a seizure doesn't mean you have to shake. You could just kind of freeze and malfunction. And it's amazing how long he was left to stand there before anyone came up and asked him uh, yeah. if he's all right. And apparently he had an incident before this that he kind of brushed off. Uh, but, you know, you see here, I mean, look, this this really does speak to a sort of decay in the Democratic uh, system, I think. I mean, this is an argument for term limits, I believe. And well, you know, uh, I will I will expand upon that in just a moment. But I do want to show this piece here. This is Diane Feinstein, who was absent for three months recovering from the shingles virus. It's been widely known. It's been not even an open secret. It's just been a known uh, thing uh, on Capitol Hill for a very long time, years and years and years. This goes back to the uh, Amy Coney Barrett confirmation hearings. And even before that, it's been widely known for a long time that her mind was slipping. Here she is taking a vote on the military budget at a Senate committee hearing where they are just taking a roll call and making the round of votes where of course everybody says i i i because of the bipartisan support for things like this and she kind of stops and tries to start monologuing before she is coached to simply just shut up and say yes so we can get the money and move this along to the senate floor here she is Hi. senator feinstein Um, you say I. Pardon me. I. Yeah. Uh, to say. I, I would like to support a yes vote on this. Oh. Um, it provides $823 billion. That's an increase of $26 billion for the Department of Defense. And the, it funds priorities submitted. Just say yes. Yeah, just say I. Okay. Just. just, just Aye. Thank you. Yeah. So there you have it. There you have it. Um, can we can we, uh, can we look at the Mitch McConnell one one more time? Sure. Of course. I just wanted to make a point about something. Sure. Um, that reaction when he froze up was my reaction when my wife's boyfriend told me I couldn't play on the Switch anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> Reminded you of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy i was i was holding that one in too much i i i just had to get that one out i'm sorry it's, yeah uh, no um, sometimes you gotta get that one <laughs> oh man you know it's funny i mean you know this kind of shit it it does i was always mixed about like term limits i always had mixed feelings because on the one hand i feel like hey you know if people uh like who's representing them and they want to just let them represent them more then why shouldn't they be allowed to just do that well, this is partly why they shouldn't be allowed to just do that. And I think another part is that you should force debates every so often, yeah. right? Like when you have term limits and you say, OK, let's say if you're in the House, you get five terms. That's 10 years, 10 years, you're out. If you're in the Senate, that's two. You get two terms, 12 years, you're out. 
it forces a debate every 10 to 12 years. It forces people to actually pay attention uh, and actually evaluate candidates on their merit rather than simply, <clears throat> pardon me, vote for who they know, which is how it works now. That's how you have a thing now where like, okay, Congress has a 15% favorability rating, but incumbents have a 90% re uh, e e e election rating. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so I think that's an interesting uh, couple of exhibits there as a case for term limits. And it's also an interesting couple of exhibits there um, as a as a reflection of the slow but very steady decline of this country and this empire. I mean, this is how an empire dies. An empire dies slowly over time where people become less invested in it and people become more and more detached from the reality of decaying circumstances, which is what you see here. What you see here. You see just a completely out of touch aristocracy with power. They have no real attachment to what is actually going on on the ground in the country or outside of the country, right? They're just pushing through this giant military budget while we're stoking World Wars three and four, we just gave three hundred and thirty million dollars to Taiwan. I don't know if you know if you heard about that. That broke overnight or early this morning. Um, so you have two world wars in in in, in the works now, um, and just that th this this is who is at the helm, and obviously the president himself, the chief executive, uh, not much better, not much better in terms of functionality? Well, I'm going to say something that, you know, is actually what what you saw there and what you see with Feinstein, it's actually an indictment of people, of the people, you know? I mean, yes, I, agree. I, don't, I don't believe in term limits either because, well, I, don't, I, I guess you, you're still kind of figuring it out, but I, I'm not for term limits because I believe if you have, to have a healthy, active democracy, it means people should choose who they want. And if you did have somebody who's doing a good job in the Congress, or FDR is a good example of somebody who, you know, why you should not have term limits. I mean, hell, imagine if you only had FDR from 1933 to 1941, and then you had Truman for the last four years of World War II, we would have all been dead or something. I don't know. We would have lost, right? So FDR having those... those um, four terms, or I guess really three, and then he died in the fourth one, um, was, uh, was, was, was necessary. And that was a good thing. And if somebody sucks, and it's the people's responsibility to vote them out. I've had this fight several times where they say, well, Nancy Pelosi should have been out years ago. We had term limits. And while that's true, it just speaks to the fact that people aren't actually acting. They aren't actually doing something to get the right people in government. And part of the problem right. is because you, you may not have the right people in government anymore. I mean, if you think about it, you've had an education system in this country that is con constantly failing people, right? In order to get a decent education, now you either have to be homeschooled or you have to afford some uppity private class, private school, you know, place where you can actually get a, a decent education. And even then, who are the people who can afford that? People who are already in government, who are already corrupt as hell, right? So you don't even have the right people anymore who should be in government, and then you don't have the population that's educated to put the right people in government or to make a government that's actually good. So all this tells me is that it's a scorching indictment of the people because if you were an alien visiting, the first thing they would ask is, well, who the hell put you in power? And why the hell are you in power? I thought this country was that people should... Is this what the people of the United States want per se and so you know that that's that's the only thing and i would just say to people make the government you want and need not the one that you think is the lesser of two evils or uh, i had a eye awakening experience the other day when i was talking to a small business owner who told me man you know um everything was better when ruben diaz was our bronx borough president and now we got this new lady who doesn't know how anything works and you know, she doesn't approve my liquor licenses and I want to open up a new store. You see, I realized how business owners and people who invest in communities want to keep the same people in power forever. And this is on a low right. level. Well, this yes, that's an excellent point. Yep. This is a low level community thing only. This is like, you know, city politics. Right. Can you imagine what it's like up at the federal level for Congress and senators? Right. 
the, like their like companies were like, oh yeah, no, we need to find sign in there again because she supports our you know missile defense projects and stuff. And, and if, if we get that new guy in there, he's going to completely kill our budget. So we have to fund Feinstein. We have to do whatever we need to do to make sure she's in there. It's a terrible system. It's a horrible system, and that's what the hell you have right now. Well, that's a great point, and and that's that's definitely something that I wanted to touch on also. But I'm glad you you beat me to it because when you have people in there for decades, that allows you to grease them more and more and more to the point where you just own them. Where at a certain point, doing your bidding just becomes their life's work, right? You have a guy like Chuck Schumer. Or I don't even know how many terms he's been here. He's been here forever i think most of my life he's been <laughs> senator of new york um you know you just grease him every cycle and he does your bidding every term and that's it and as long as you keep the same people in place who just make a habit of taking the money from whatever interest group you represent and then going to bat for whatever interest group that is um you don't ever have to force a conversation about the morality or the sort of ethics or the responsibility uh, of that. And so that's one argument also. And so the other thing that, that I would say is like, look, I mean, we've given up on the two party system entirely. This is a post duopoly aligned show here. And so I think you ultimately need more parties uh, in, in the mix. But even within the parties themselves, if there's to be any movement or any momentum anywhere, you need debates within the parties and you need primaries within the parties. And I was actually sitting in on the forward parties one year anniversary call last night because a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine works there. And, you know, I don't support them. Obviously, they're a more centrist organization. They're not my taste. But, I, you know, I, I think no label should run somebody like whoever wants to get in the mix should absolutely get in the mix and forward actually has some candidates on the ballot in some places uh, around the country now so even though you know i wouldn't vote for a forward candidate at this point um i say you know whatever the more voices in there the more pressure there is on the two-party system that's great but yang was on the call last night and he said you know he made a he made a good point made a very fair point which is that we talk about how the two-party system is broken he says in most places in this country you don't even have a two-party system in most states most districts most municipalities um you have a one-party system like That's true. if you live in california the republican party is irrelevant right uh, if you live in texas the democratic party is largely irrelevant mitch mcconnell you live in kentucky the democratic party is irrelevant so when we talk about stalemate now nothing happens it's not because the two parties can't get together and do anything in most of these circumstances is it's because Single parties are too corrupted by status quo donor interests to do anything. California Democrats have a super majority. They promised the single payer system. And then what happened? They got the support necessary to do it and they backed off. The Republicans were not a factor in that, right? Uh, that was it. That was entirely conflict within the Democratic Party because the real debate in this country is not between Democrats and Republicans. It's between Democrats and their donors or in red states and red areas. It's between Republicans uh, and donors. That's where the real debate happens. And we don't get to weigh in on that as voters. And so the only way to force that is to open up the process as much as possible, as often as possible, which I do think is an argument for term limits because it at least forces that conversation now that's only the beginning of it right um and i ultimately think you need more parties in the mix but that's certainly a starting point because when you look at those two videos like that it's very very clear uh it, it, there there's no mystery at all as to how we got where we got when you look at that of course and you know we actually we've been talking about starting a process of actually running people in new york city independent on all levels, from local, from as small as you can, all the way up to Senate with Diane, of course, you know. Um, you know, Kynan is not Congress age, he's only 22, uh, but he can run for state assembly, state Senate, he can run for council if he wanted to. And uh, there are rumors of me possibly running for Congress as an independent which, you know, we may or may not be studying the FEC guidelines right now and trying to figure out who can be a treasurer. Beautiful, but well, you're mid-20s, right? I'm 25. Well, 24, I'll be 25 in September, which is the legal limit to, to run for okay. Congress. So, Beautiful. 
Yeah. So, you know, the thing is, we need a treasurer, actually. So if anybody here wants to be the treasurer and is willing to get arrested by the FEC, if you like lie and cook <laughs> books, let's talk. Put that, in, put that on the uh, um, Indeed job posting. <laughs> That's that's what the treasurer is like. They take an oath to be the treasurer, and if they like cook the books, or if they like lie or misreport, even if the candidate does something illegal, it goes back to the treasurer. They get arrested, and then we just get a new right. treasurer. So, but uh, you know, we have been talking about doing like because you're right. There is a one party system in pretty much a lot of these states. I mean, Florida, you could maybe make a, a, a an argument for, but. Even then, that, like that's DeSantis, and you know, the Republicans actually do kind of dominate right now in Florida. But we have been talking about this because the look, New York State Dems are not like any other Dems, man. This is the this is the the state where Wall Street is. This is the Chuck Schumer state. Chuck Schumer is the fundraiser for the Democratic Party. Okay, he is the one who raises the most money for them. In fact, he did something with his last race where what he did was. He took the money he raised for his campaign and donated it to everyone else's campaigns because he said, I don't need it. Yeah, he doesn't need you know? it. Right. Of course. Yeah, he, he doesn't need it. And so um, we do need people to start taking back their government. And that doesn't mean that everyone has to run for something either. That is an action. That is a, a, a form of that. But I think just standing up and intervening and calling it out and increasing the political tension to let other people be awakened to the fact that their country is run by lunatics and exactly. they need to step up rather than just be spectators. I think that's the most important thing right now is to tell people you're not a spectator in this. You can act like one, but your inaction will shape the future. Wouldn't it be better if your action shaped the future than your inaction? Exactly. No, I mean, that's a great point. That's a great way of articulating it. You need to increase the tension because where there's tension, there's movement. Where there's movements, there can be momentum. Not always. Sometimes no momentum results from movement. Sometimes it's just chaos. But at least chaos is some sort of kinetic energy of a kind, right? Whereas now you have almost none of that. You have almost none of that. And that's a very good way of putting it because it demonstrates something that I've been saying a lot, which is that you have these two political realities unfolding in our country right now, where you have on the one hand, you have unrest, you have chaos, you have social instability, you have societal collapse. But then on the other hand, when you look at the realm of electoral politics, you have normie candidates continuing to win. In the midterms, you had a very, very normie result. A lot of incumbents get sent back on in on both sides, Democrat, GOP, right? So what is that? What does that speak to? That speaks to a real fissure between people who feel like they are only spectators in the thing. That's where you have all of this decline, all of this decay, all of this chaos. And then you have the other half of the country basically convincing themselves that it's in their interest to manage whatever decline is happening as comfortably as they can for themselves. And that's why you have the McConnells, the Feinsteins, uh, being returned to office time and time again. They are the most extreme examples now because of what they're going through personally. They're getting so old that they're falling apart in office, literally. Look at who the president is, right? But that, that's the, that could be said for just about everybody. That could be said for just about everybody. Um, whether they are running as governors, congresspeople, senators, you have this you, you, you have this stranglehold on the electoral system um, that, that the normies have really won. And the only way to break that is to have more people get involved, more people involved. And if, if those doors are closed to people inside the two-party system, which I strongly believe they are, then that is the case for third party candidates, whether it's Cornell West, whether it's whoever the libertarians put up on the Senate side, whether it's someone like Diane, whether it's forward party candidates, they have some people running for Congress, right? Whether you support these candidates or not is not the point. The point is you're not going to generate any kinetic energy unless you open up the system to more people. And that has to be the task at hand. 
I think that the 2024 election year has the ability to be where independents win, but only if the conditions are created now. What right. you do in 2023 will determine whether or not independents can win in 2024. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Let's take some super chats before we head out of here. We had a couple people more sign up at Patreon. That warms the heart. Thank you very much. That is what we need to have happen. Um, you know, we've we've been talking a lot about how precarious these tech platforms are, and now we're here. We've been warned, and so if we don't start diversifying now in terms of getting people subscribed at Patreon, Substack, go over to Rumble, follow us on Rumble. We got 100 people in the Rumble chat right now. Hit that follow button if you're over there on Rumble. Very important. We have a really, really lively Rumble chat going right now, which is super, super encouraging to see. Please find another place to follow us. Don't count on YouTube. Like I said, we love it here on YouTube. We intend to be here on YouTube as long as YouTube will have us. But um, the, the time has come where we know for sure we cannot depend on this to sustain the show. So to, the, to those uh, couple people who signed up at Patreon over the course of this broadcast, thank you so much. You are going to be on the next scroll at the top of the next show. And please sign up at Substack as well. Do dissidents.substack.com. Temporal Police, thank you for the $4.99. We appreciate that very much. Do dissidents.substack.com. You can go and sign up for free. That's just an email list. So for those who signed up for free, there are a lot of you guys who joined the free Substack after the last show, you should have gotten an email this morning saying, hey, we're live at 9 a.m. You'll get those the day of every show so you know when we're going live. You'll get an audio podcast version of the live stream. So in case you miss it and you're going to listen to it on the train or in the car, whatever, you get that too. It's really, really worth joining that Substack, even if you can't join as a paid member. Uh, Baza, thanks for the 10 bucks. Nice news shirt. Oh, yeah, I got uh, yeah, I, I decided to put on a little button down this morning uh, to make me look more awake than I am. I hope it worked on you. <laughs> exactly. China Shill, thank you for the $2. Mitch, when the weed to indica dominant. What is that? It's Do you a, know that's that's weed, weed, weed strains. Yeah, man. Weed indica strains? It makes you sleepy. Is that right? Is that that strain? I know you're, you're, you're not a weed guy, Jose. I've never been a weed guy myself. No, I was a weed guy when I was like 16, 17, and then I stopped. Oh, okay. So you were, and then you stopped. All right. Interesting interesting yeah i was never it always just made me very tired maybe i got that that strain that he's talking about that's why i never <laughs> tried anything else it made me very uninteresting and very exhausted i did not feel like a more interesting person on weed when i have a few drinks i feel more interesting when i when i would smoke i'd feel less interesting so that's kind of how i judged it pete sweet thanks for the five bucks and pete is a member thank you for being a member shout out to jose keep up the civil disobedience we all have to get to the streets. Yellow vest movement now in the U.S. Well, yeah, if you're in the New York City area, come out on August 6th. Uh, that is a week from Sunday. Humanity for Peace, 1 to 4 p.m. at Dag Hammarskjöld Plaza, East 47th Street and 2nd Avenue in New York City. That is very, very walkable from Grand Central Station. So if you're going to take a train in, Grand Central's 42nd and Lexington, you're talking about a 10-minute walk tops. Uh, to get over there. So it's very, very commuter friendly. So if you're in the New York area and you can get to Grand Central, it's a very, very quick walk over to the rally. Exactly. Um, the People Infinite for $5. Thank you very much. When Jose said wife's boyfriend, is this a joke or is he Polly? I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> NB, LOL. Keep up the great podcast and activism, Jose. I am not married. I am not married. I don't have. I don't have a girlfriend. Nothing. It's. It's all for jokes. Is what my wife's boyfriend wants me to say. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it was well delivered, though. Well delivered. Uh, the Robert Escobar show. Thank you for the five dollars. Appreciate that. We're seeing some new folks here giving us some super chats, which is great to see. If this is your first time here, please hit that subscribe button. Very, very important that you stay in touch. We just got another free Substack subscriber. That's what I'm talking about. It's great when you feel uh, like the audience listens to you. You know, we used to do audio shows and we didn't have a live audience, you know, so we would just record them and then we would put them out the next day. And so the idea that we had any audience at all was really kind of an abstraction, right? Because you just don't really think about the audience experience all that much when you pre-record and put out an audio show. So for a while, when we started doing video content, we were just kind of, both Russ and myself, we're kind of in denial about the fact that anyone watches the show. 
<laughs> and so it's kind of surreal when you say something on here and then you get an alert. Hey, new patron, new Substack subscriber. Isn't it funny how that works? But thank you guys very much. Robert Escobar Show, thanks for the five bucks. What should people watching do to push solutions? What are the SOP, standard operating procedures, for getting involved and making progress? How can we all get on the same page? Well, I'll toss to Jose because I'm sure Jose has a, a better answer for this than, than I do. But that is the point of these rallies. Like that, that is why these rallies happen. That's why these rallies are important. They're not just photo ops. They're not just things you do for a day and have fun and take pictures and go home. They are, when they're done right, they are organizing events. You go and you meet like-minded people. You talk to people. Hey, where are you from? Okay, let's do something else. Let's do another one, you know, down the road. Um, you build organizational power. That That's the point. So I think actually getting out in the streets, rallying, protesting, meeting people, brainstorming with people, that's really what that's that's the main purpose that those rallies serve it's not just about what happens that day it's about going there exactly. meeting people brainstorming about what you can do going forward the rally is a starting point it is not an end point it is a place where we will begin the process um of the international coalition i think we took the idea of the rage against the war machine and they're, and they're involved in this angela and nick are totally involved in the process too but we've made it from national to international Right. So that, I think, is the big uh, kind of um, evolved uh, move we took, which is to make this take it, take it, take it one step, one notch further. And this is the, the rally is just the beginning of that. Yeah, indeed. Absolutely. And in terms oh, of I, sorry, go ahead. No, I just want to say also uh, what you could be doing right now is one, share the rally, tell people about it, tell people to come there uh if you go to humanityforpeace.net we have leaflets that people can download on the bottom you go there you can print some what i've been doing with Kynan is we go to the amc theaters where the uh, oppenheimer movie is sold out yeah humanityforpeace.net thank you where the oppenheimer movie is actually sold out and we just hand out the leaflets and talk to people about it and we get people who are coming in and out it's a very it's actually a cool experience to talk to somebody who's seen the film because when they seen the film, they see the ending and they're like, wow, like we are really at the verge of that. And then I can say, great, now come to our rally. And the other thing is those are New Yorkers, but no matter where you are, get the rally, get the leaflet out and just tell people about it because there's also a live stream if you're not in New York. But don't make that be an excuse for you not to show up. You have to show up. That's a great idea to be handing out pamphlets and leaflets outside of the Oppenheimer movie um have you seen the movie i've seen it twice now yeah okay it's good i i would recommend it to everyone on your show go watch it and you know what our 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 our, our uh, strategy has been so effective that code pink has now like started doing a similar thing too where they're oh, beautiful good people to go watch the film and then leaflet outside it good 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 yeah i haven't seen it it's three hours so it's hard for me with two kids to get out russell wants to watch that and we he wanted to do a dual review of oppenheimer and barbie since those are like two zeitgeist movies now um yeah. but i would love to get to see oppenheimer actually because it, it just i mean it first of all it looks good i mean N nolan always you know puts on a show on a big screen so it'd be, it would be great to to see see the movie but um obviously very very topical um and so yeah so I'm, I'm very very glad to hear it comes with your endorsement because nolan's politics i mean he doesn't really make political films but i know there was there was a lot of talk about the dark knight movie being sort of a a pro bush film you know the big monologue is some people yeah no there was and and i understand that like when alfred tells him you know some people want to just make the world burn you have to endure you know People took that as code for stay the course in Iraq. Don't give in to the chaos agents, right? As this embrace of order above chaos. And that was kind of one of the themes of that film that made it really interesting. Um, and so, you know, I, and obviously I don't want to go on a whole thing about that now. But, um, yeah, it was interesting. I was, I was always kind of wondering what the political bent, if any, this Oppenheimer film would have. And maybe it doesn't have much. Maybe it's just, is it just pretty much a straightforward retelling? Or do you did you get the sense that there was a certain message it wanted to get across well you know i mean i think i think nolan accidentally made a very great political film for our contemporary because shakespeare what he used to do is he would write historical plays in his contemporary 
that had right. nothing to do with the contemporary, but actually it did. So it was like his way of getting a political message across. I don't right. know if Nolan did that on purpose or not, but he accidentally does that with Oppenheimer. So it, if anything, it only supports our whole thing about nuclear weapons and how we're on the verge of World War III. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Uh, all right, let's go to uh, Sick Komodo Dragon. Thank you for the four ninety nine. The propaganda against third parties seems too strong to overcome. I'll never vote for duopoly, but most people won't consider third parties due to programming. It's funny because, you know, we're seeing a lot of polling now. Like there was a big poll that said 47% of Americans were considering voting for a third party in 2024. And then um, when you put a third party, an unnamed third party option up against Biden and Trump, uh, that third party option polled at 30%. You're absolutely right that that polling always collapses in the end to low single digits because people can talk shit a year out. It's not the first time where people have said, oh, yeah, I'd be open to voting third party, and then they don't do it. If it is Biden and Trump, which now that Russell's not here, I can say it looks like it's going to be Biden and Trump without having to hear the Ron DeSantis <laughs> retort. Uh, just kidding, Russell. But yeah, no, uh, it, it, look, odds are that's what it's going to be. If it is Biden and Trump, um, that does open up a unique possibility for a third party. Not that a third party can win in that situation. Not even that a third party can get double digits in that situation. But they can get mid to high single digits. Like, I definitely see an opening for Cornell to break 5% in that situation. Because with Biden versus Trump, you have a very, very unique situation. I think it's only happened once before in American history uh, where you would literally have a race between two failed incumbent presidents you can make the case that biden has failed and then you can make the case that trump has failed so literally i mean it is the perfect circumstance for a third party candidate to make the very simple argument you've literally tried both of these guys before they both suck. Yeah. <laughs> and they both suck you literally both of them have a proven track record of what america looks like with them as president and so that creates a very very unique opportunity i think yeah i agree Alrighty, folks. Well, we want to thank you guys very much for being here. This was a great uh, Sunday, a Friday morning show. Pardon me. Jose, it was great to see you again, my friend. Really a pleasure. Thank you so much for filling in and co-hosting. And uh, like I said, I hope we can uh, move some of those posters for you here. Let me put up the poster link once once more. You, you sent that to me uh, on Twitter. I will open that up because we have one more super chat that we got to read here. Sick Komodo just came in a second one. Thanks for the second donation there. Sorry, just blackpilled as a lifelong Green Party and Libertarian voter. Little pissed off looking for that 5%. I feel you, man. I feel you, man. But uh, I would say keep the faith. I think this cycle uh, is definitely worth pursuing in terms of an independent breakout candidate. Because like I said, I mean, if you have Biden versus Trump, I mean, it does not come around. There was one other guy who was voted out and then ran again. I forget. I think it was like late 1800s or something like that. Somebody in the chat knows. Some Somebody in the chat knows. Who was it who served one term, they were voted out, and then they ran again four years later? Happened once before. I think it was like late 1800s. The name is just not coming to me now. Um, but yeah, this would be the first time since then where you can we, you can make that argument. Uh, all right, let's let's get this Etsy link up on the screen here one more time, so we can help support Jose and help support this this rally and this concert that's happening. The AOC Damn. war poster, seventeen ninety nine. Yours for the low price of seventeen ninety nine. Get it by August first to eighth if you order today. Yeah, so we're you getting go. a new batch in today, so yeah, beautiful. So that is uh, that is on Etsy, and uh, I will copy and paste the link to that into the description of the video as soon as the stream is complete here. And so if you guys want to hang around or just refresh the link after the stream goes dark, uh, that link will be available uh, in just a couple of minutes. But anyway... We want to thank you all very, very much for being here this morning. We are going to be back here on Sunday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. Like I said, we do three shows per week now. Uh, Sunday nights at 7 p.m., Wednesday nights at 8 p.m., and the Friday morning do streams at 9 a.m. Patrick Donahue said he might call in, but I don't see you here. So if you want to call in uh, next week on the morning show, Patrick, I would love to hear from you because you had an interesting topic that you were going to bring up. 
But in any case, we want to thank you guys all for being here this morning. You can go to patreon.com front slash do dissidents. We're really pushing that hard. Now that we've been warned by YouTube, we have to start building the project out on other outlets. That means Patreon. That means Substack. That means Rumble. That means follow us on Twitter. Follow Jose on Twitter as well, if you haven't. Jose is up to 75,000 followers over there, right? Your handle yeah. is Joe's B. Trigger, right? Joe's B. Trigger. J-O-S-B-T-R-I-G-G-A. Jose B. Because Jose A. was taken. Okay, beautiful. All right. Jose B. Trigger sounds good. Jose Trigger. I get, I get what that was going to be. Um, but yes, so go over there and uh, follow him so you can see all his interventions when he posts the videos. And uh, we will see you all next time. Thank you very much for being here. Jose, have fun at Legoland this weekend. I hope you stay <laughs> hydrated and, <laughs> you know, make sure you drink a lot of water. Yeah. I know it's expensive in there, so maybe bring a bottle of water to, to take in there with you. Okay, great. Thank you. Beautiful. All right, folks. Thank you very much for being here. We very much appreciate you guys. And uh, we will see you back here on Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern. Back with Russell Dobular, of course. Uh, and until then, please be safe. Please be well. No uh, singing bell to sign off, but I will give my best attempt to say courage. Thank you very much. Please clap.